you, uh, thank you, Adrienne. And uh, let me also uh, first uh, very briefly uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me here and uh, the opportunity to uh, see so many people whom I've interacted with, uh, working with, or uh, have the pleasure to read. Uh, it's still early, despite a little bit of uh, delay, uh, so I hope you will excuse me as um, I try to present to you a few arguments and thoughts of a paper in the making, uh, which I sent a little bit too late to the organizers, but they can still uh, send it to you. And, yeah, like this. And um, let me first say that uh, with the number of people in this room, with Frank, with Dorte Bola, and uh, with some people who are not here, most uh, notably with Tanya Borzel in uh, the Free University of Berlin, we are currently uh, working on a project of maximize, uh, a project which is looking to integrate the lessons of the last enlargement, and by this I mean the Eastern enlargement, of course, um, not forgetting Croatia that happened afterwards, and a number of possibilities or lack thereof for the EU to continue further with enlargement, and the project is somewhat optimistically called maximizing the European Union's integration capacity. Um, one of the uh, things which we discover so far in this project, and we are right in the middle of the field work, so um, I don't have results from this yet, is that it is much easier to discuss enlargement in Central and Eastern European member states of the EU than it is in the old member states of the EU. And this is such something important which I think we should bear in mind uh, in the spirit also of what uh, Alexander uh, Treschel said uh, a moment ago. Uh, in fact, our data collection in Bulgaria, in uh, Poland, and also in Serbia and Macedonia has proceeded considerably faster and easier than our data collection in the Netherlands where I'm based uh, or in Germany. And the idea of this particular part of the project is to gather data on the discourses and narratives that help people make sense of the last enlargement. Uh, because, of course, we have uh, quite a bit of public opinion data. Uh, we have also another part of the project that is dealing with evaluating economic um, aspects of what the EU has done and will be doing and uh, differentiated models of integration as in the future. But when looking at discourses and narratives, uh, our view has been in this project um, that it is just as important to see what people make of enlargement also in the old member states. And if the data of um, the showing of the European Parliament elections is any, uh, any indication to go by, um, they're not very happy. And if our data gathering experience is anything to go by, uh, the Dutch couldn't care less. We literally cannot l get anyone to come and simply talk to us about how they experienced the last enlargement. So I think uh, on this note, I'm not going to say more about the project. I just hope that uh, you'll be checking this and you'll be, um, you'll be looking at this. Um, we are publishing a number of working papers and the results in particular of the comparison of discourses and narratives done with Q methodology will be coming in December this year um, as a working paper. But now I want to move to what this paper really should be about so that we don't don't uh, accumulate too much delay. And uh, what the paper really, uh, what I want to talk to you uh, today about is to throw a little bit of stone in the pond of our uh, great satisfaction here uh, of that enlargement has gone well. Um, I have been myself, and of course I fully agree with the, with the normative and ideas-based uh, um, things which were said here by the ambassador and by Commissioner Barroso, I've been myself uh, going around Europe for uh, uh, several years, and especially around the Netherlands, again, the old member states, and my own students are the most difficult to convince, and saying enlargement was a success for the EU for all the reasons that you mentioned. Um, and I was also saying the European Union achieved a lot throughout uh, with its own tools and with its own uh, methods and tools that it had developed, most of and paramount of which was, of course, the use conditionality. And uh, what I want to do today is to uh, take a critical look at my own work and at the work of many of us who have developed the idea that European Union conditionality worked, and it worked well to induce new member states and candidate states to adopt. Uh, its rules and regulations, so this whole kind of Europeanization is, and to ask 
if then it works so well, how come it doesn't work in the Western Balkans? How come it doesn't work in Ukraine? Because in the middle of this, of course, uh, celebration and congratulation, we shouldn't forget that just across the border, one of the most successful member states, Poland, uh, we have a situation uh, which is dramatic and getting more dramatic by the minute in Ukraine. And of course, while we cannot blame the Ukraine on the EU, and we shouldn't, uh, we also shouldn't forget that the whole uh, a story in Ukraine in a way started with the failed attempt to sign the seemingly technical, innocuous, uh, even a far-reaching trade agreement with the EU, the deep uh, and comprehensive free trade agreement in November last year. So my talk, this, this story which I've been working on was also entitled in another incarnation, why Poland but not Ukraine? And in this I mean why Poland but not Ukraine, not for Ukraine to join the EU tomorrow, not for Bosnia, Herzegovina or Macedonia to move faster towards EU membership. But why has the EU been able to transform Central and Eastern European countries so well, Bulgaria and Romania including, and Bulgaria I've been watching particularly closely since I come from Bulgaria, this magnetic or transformative power, why has the EU been so good in doing this and how come that more or less more or less the same tools and the same uh, uh, approaches has not, have not worked further, not only in Ukraine, but in the Western Balkans. I think this is an important puzzle. I don't think I'm going to resolve it, but I think it's an issue that we should, in this distinguished uh, uh, company, discuss. Now, if I were to summarize the uh, conditionality, the enlargement literature, and I'm not going to do this at length because a lot of the people who, who wrote this literature are here in this room and I wouldn't uh, like to make a straw man of yours and my own work, uh, but we have had a considerable literature, um, a lot of this uh, summarized in uh, the volume that was started here by Frank Schimofenich and Uli Sedemeyer in uh, 2005 and also in Milada Vahudova's book, which basically stressed that by and large the European Union was quite successful in inducing candidate states to take over its rules and norms and here we're talking about the key, mostly we're talking about policies, but we're also talking about what we call the enlargement key. We're talking about a number of other conditions which you put in the course of accession. And with the years, I noticed that even though the original framework was quite sophisticated and aimed to test socialization mechanisms and policy lesson drawing mechanisms as, as against rational cost benefit incentives mechanisms, uh, we basically have come to a simplified understanding of conditionality, which again, even though I'm not blaming it on our original work, has taken reign in, especially in the policy community and which has, I think, led us to the wrong path to an exaggerated sense of how important the EU can be and how much the EU can achieve. And this, this simplified understanding conditionality has been more or less could be summarized by this uh, rather simplistic picture which I've got here, which essentially suggests that as long as the European Union has a credible promise of accession and a credible threat of exclusion, um, uh, and it applies it consistently and the adoption costs are reasonably low, then compliance, so Europeanization in a way I prefer to, to use compliance and reform follows. And now, uh, this, of course, appeared to work rather well on the basis of the set of cases that we had at the time. And when I have been reflecting on my puzzle, why doesn't this work so well, not only in Ukraine, where we could bring also all kinds of other characteristics to bear, but let's say in a country like Macedonia or Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, then I started thinking about the lessons from the comparative democratization literature, which I've been interested in for many years, where Adam Przeworski made a very pertinent observation that uh, because the cases have been created by history, we have been tending to focus on groups of variables which can only be expanded and other comparative cases be brought uh, when we get more cases in a different historical period. So in a way, what we get now, uh, several, we we have a number of other cases in a different historical period which we can use as comparative cases and add and reassess our frameworks. So that's basically what I'm trying to do and it is very much, as I said, a work in progress and an attempt to take a critical look at our own work rather than uh, give you the full answers. 
And what we see today is that even if the EU applies uh, its conditionality, if we assume that it is consistent, that the EU has learned well, the European Union has even added a new strategy with Croatia, it has upped further the stakes and the pressure and the consistency on rule of law, on all kinds of things that the EU considers important, that domestic elites, domestic governments, are not responding in the same way as the countries in Central and Eastern Europe in 1989. I think this is quite clear, and again, not only Ukraine, which is the example foremost in our minds, but also, also Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, Macedonia, to a great extent, we are not seeing the same responses to EU conditionality, not to mention, of course, Turkey. So, in order to resolve this puzzle, I, I went back again to an old argument of mine, uh, and not only of mine, uh, that the processes of democratization, transition to democracy and the market in Central and Eastern Europe in 1989, and the process of joining the European Union uh, exerted very important mutual influences on each other. In the region, in Bulgaria, especially when I speak to officials, uh, there is a great tendency, and there was something also in the way that, that, that Commissioner Barroso spoke about it, um, to talk about those things as if they're one and the same thing. But of course they aren't, and we can see very clearly that the interaction between the EU and these countries at the time in 1989 created a particular window of opportunity uh, in a particular setting which does not exist currently. Now, up to here, nothing, nothing so, so dramatic, and we uh, also uh, we can accept uh, this is a historical institutionalist argument, but I'm looking for, for more. I'm, I'm trying to see what was it uh, of the mechanisms and variables that was so similar in this group of countries and is different now, which would, would come down to my methodological argument that we had a group of cases then at that time which presented we had a set of similar characteristics and we don't have now. And of course here we have uh, Milada's wonderful uh, work and a number of others who have uh, basically shown that what the European Union did in the process of the 1990s and uh, before accession was to interact with the reformist elites to strengthen them and to give the opportunity of regimes to transform. I go a little bit further in the paper and I would like to argue that what made this possible was the fact that the institutions, that the institutions and the, uh, the actors in Central and Eastern Europe were in flux. Uh, not only at the geopolitical level, there is a geopolitical uh, panel later on, so I'm not going to talk about it, but also at the institutional level. And if we go back here to the familiar argument from the Europeanization literature that uh, the European Union influence always goes mediated not only by domestic actors, but also by domestic institutions. If we ask ourselves what kind of institutions existed in 1989, in 1990, 1992, 93, when the countries applied to join the European Union, what kind of institutions existed uh, at the time? And the answer is these were nascent institutions of democracies very similar to the European Union democracies. And from another literature, from the literature on state capture and state restructuring of my friend Van Linganev, of Anna Gjimawa uh, Bessu, who is here, we know that at the same time other processes were taking place, processes of state capture, processes of formation of networks that were trying to pull out resources of the state. So these processes were taking place at the same time, uh, but because of the fact that there was no other possibility of these, these processes and these networks to legitimize themselves except through the narrative of return to Europe. And I agree with you, this is a narrative. These countries have always been in Europe. At the same time, it is quite clear, and again, this literature exists, uh, that there were a number of legitimizing narratives, return to Europe, Central Europe, also in Bulgaria and Romania, as Bulgarian historian Maria Todorova has shown. There was a strong legitimizing narrative, so any political elite any political party that wanted to be accepted in Central and Eastern Europe in the 1990s basically had to pay at least lip service to the EU. Now this changed, this has changed. My main argument is that when transition was over, this is not 
anymore the case. And this creates a different set of domestic preferences for domestic actors and also creates a different set of domestic institutions, not all of which are conducive for the EU to be listened to. So this is essentially where I'm going to. If you look at institutional structure that has formed after more than uh, two decades of transition, we have countries which are basically hybrid regimes uh, away from democracies in which you have neo-patrimonial networks, if we look at the Ukraine. And for these networks, legitimation mechanisms do not necessarily grow through the European Union. I'm not saying they may not in the future. Again, it depends because reformist elites, as we've seen on the Maidan, are present. You have institutional structures, as in Bosnia-Herzegovina after the Dayton Agreement, which basically push the most identity-based uh, elites to the fore. And for these elites, again, legitimation does not pass through the European Union. Therefore, my argument is, or hopefully will emerge uh, in this way as I work further on this paper, that the mechanisms whereby the European Union empowers reform elites and in exchange they push for the reforms and the whole process goes towards accession are not present in countries where elites' main preoccupation is either to steal from the state and to maintain new patrimonial networks or in, which, or in countries in which elites basically maintain their hold to power and to elections through identity-based mechanisms. So if we take this into consideration, if we look a little bit further at the future ahead, because I'm looking not only at Europeanization of existing member states, but also at the new at countries which might, might, change, might join in the future. I think we should be very careful, again, with comparisons, just a brief, brief note, another couple of minutes and I'm finished, a brief note with comparisons. We have seen these wonderful comparisons by the European Commission. The data here, those slides that you see here, are from the document the European Commission got out in order to promote the association agreement with, um, with Ukraine. And I fully subscribe to it, and this is absolutely wonderful, but I think we should be careful at the science level and at the policy level to watch our comparisons and ask what these comparisons are good for. Because there's also, next to the European Commission data, and all the data on governance and all the data on public administration, which we have, um, the data even control of corruption looks much better than people realize, um, um, which is also very, very interesting to just take a brief look. So all of this is there, no doubt. But if we look at another comparison, I think it is important to also ask the question, if the European Union promotes growth under what conditions does it promote growth? Because if the European Union, as we claim, promotes growth through trade and opening and so on and so forth, and there is economists here, so I'm not going to, to go into depth, but just to, to make a little illustration that we should be critical of our own assumptions now more than ever, um, how come that the European Union did not promote growth in Croatia? And again, I'll leave this to the economists, but I think the answer is that growth without domestic drive and domestic reform does not come from the European Union as, as mana from heaven. So again, my plea here in this paper and this presentation is let's watch the domestic actors and domestic institutions that mediate the European Union's influence. And another very interesting comparison case here just for our, our uh, waking up in this morning, I was looking at GDP, I was looking at this wonderful comparison between uh, 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 Poland and Ukraine and the GDP. I also looked at Bulgaria's GDP and how it developed compared to Ukraine uh, for the last uh, uh, period. And Bulgaria's GDP essentially develops the same as Belarus. But if you look at Belarus, you have to ask yourself, uh, uh, where, where did the Belarusian growth come from? And of course, there's also balance of payments and all kinds of other things. But I think just, just to keep us, keep us a little bit away from the self-congratulatory tone, which I also have had very often in the Netherlands trying to show everybody that enlargement is a success. So I'm coming, yes. Different cases, different questions and outcomes are important here, and I think we should look very carefully at domestic elites and domestic institutions before we claim that the European Union has kept its transformative power for democratization and for domestic reform in the future. So, thank you very much.